My name is John Richardson, and um, I'm the CEO of Atalo. We're a digital platform um, that works with organizations in many cities. We work with about 150 different uh, local governments um, doing uh, participatory processes, um, many of them budgeting processes. Um, so we'll chat a little bit about that and about you know the importance of digital democracy or of, of blockchain for digital engagement. And uh, this is my friend and colleague, Leon. Hi. Um, yeah, my name is Leon Eriksson. I work with a project called Gitcoin, uh, where we do budgeting, but not with uh, local governments in cities, but instead with cryptocurrency communities. So these communities are mostly largely consisting of like technologists and like entrepreneurs who who work on software projects uh, that are I would say primarily beneficial inside that like software and blockchain ecosystem, but um, some other people, uh, some other communities have used our software too uh, for participatory budgeting uh, for budgets outside of that software community. Um, yeah, on on that project, I'm I'm doing product management for our identity solution to make sure every voter that's participating in in the budgeting process is uniquely participating. And um, yeah, looking forward to to this conversation um, with John on how like this the city technology and and blockchain technology might fit together or not. <laughs> yeah. And um, yeah, thanks uh, so much for the invitation to to be here, Christopher. Thank you. You know, um, Leanne didn't mention it, but a fellow in Gitcoin also work together. So you know, we both. Um, do budgeting processes with communities, but we also are working together on a couple of different projects. And, and one is uh, the digital identity solution uh, that he mentioned. Right. And I'm not sure how many people watching have heard of Web3, um, but it's kind of an umbrella term that includes blockchain, but it also includes a bunch of other technologies that have um, just kind of become associated with blockchain. And one of the most important ones is digital identity. and um, I'm very interested in digital identity and, and blockchain solutions for a couple of reasons. Um, you, know, you know that um, blockchain is basically uh, 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 like a database or a decentralized registry and it's you know, enabled the whole economy, a, a crypto economy. But what has always excited me about blockchain is the ability to record votes in a decentralized and trusted way. And uh, you know, I think as our democracy evolves, and becomes more digital, blockchain is gonna be a very important piece because it enables kind of a, a very trustable um, way of storing votes that, you know, looking at the controversy in the US elections right now could be avoided. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts about the blockchain. But together with that um, is also these digital identity solutions. And it's such a big problem. You know, we run these community engagement processes and it's always a challenge uh, to make sure that each person that's participating is an actual person and not somebody logging in from a whole bunch of different computers, voting a whole bunch of different times. And, um, you know, it's, a, it's an early stage of these digital identity solutions. And maybe, Leon, you can say just a bit about kind of what you're doing around digital identity, because I think it's a very cutting edge for what Gitcoin is doing. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so basically at Gitcoin, we have a, similar problem where like usually how how the like gitcoin budgeting process goes is that you have some philanthropist or like some organization that wants to distribute like a budget to to software projects in their community so like builders or entrepreneurs that that develop some piece of software need funding to to pay uh, the development resources etc and so basically have these have these matching pools of funding that then get distributed according to some community vote. Um, we use a novel voting method called quadratic voting um, or quadratic funding. We can dive into how that works a little bit later. But as in most voting methods uh, that are democratic, it's um, important that every person only gets to vote once, right? Like otherwise you could like submit a thousand ballots as opposed to just one. And um, since since we don't work with like 
traditional governments and like with that also don't have and like these software communities are very global it's kind of hard for us to decide what identity certificate do we want to trust to make sure that every voter is only participating once so um we've kind of taken a more um yeah com complex approach even i would say um where where we don't have like one identity certificate say like a you know us passport or like um i don't know french passport or whatever but um we we basically have accept a bunch of identity providers so you could verify through the so-called gitcoin passport that you have like a twitter account that you have a github account that you have donated and passed or like voted and passed gitcoin grants programs that you have participated in other applications in that software ecosystem that you have contributed to other software projects on github and then based on this like multitude of of identities that you validate and and we aggregate that in in what we call the gitcoin passport um we then assess your your vote and your identity so if you have like a bunch of um identity solutions verified that's probably a very good indicator of like you being an actual human then at the same time we we create like some cryptic strings to keep track of okay has this ident like this twitter user been verified from the same twitter account or different twitter accounts so we can make sure it has actually been verified from like a unique twitter account that hasn't participated through other ballots in our decision so kind of by aggregating all these entity providers making sure the providers that you verified have been submitted uniquely um we we then assess your identity and and if like according to our score we think that's good enough evidence uh we we count your vote basically um i think we are like having all that said um we are very early in in doing this and it's like um kind of the second iteration of this product that we are now and it's certainly not perfect and i'm sure that it's like it's not super robust as in like it's impossible for somebody to get voting rights twice and um it won't work for any community in the world right while it kind of like the providers that we accept work for you know the the our open source software community they might not work for like a local government in you know center uh in the center of the usa or whatever um so we we kind of need to um iterate there but the but the vision that we have with this identity provider is that actually other projects cities or technology projects can add providers to to this protocol the gitcoin passport and then when you assess whether one of your participants or voters is unique or not or like a member of your community you can score the providers that you care about so basically your community so you like a community administrator so you accept or like allow list that in the providers that you deem legit then participant shows up with a passport some identity providers attached and verified and then you assess that and, and distribute some rights or responsibilities to that participant so basically building like a kind of yeah um identity protocol with like different inputs and then anybody or like any community can make sense of it in their own way like in, in the way that kind of suits their needs yeah you know it would have been really useful for us so you know as i mentioned before we do a lot of uh, budgeting processes and financial decision making processes for local communities and we did one about a year ago uh, for a community called Stratford in the, in the east, uh, on the eastern coast of Canada. It was a capital projects uh, budgeting process. It was very controversial, you know. Um, and there was concern by uh, the local finance officers that not all of the votes that were submitted were genuine votes. And so we had to run a bit of a, a validation process to, uh, to, you know, pull out... Um, some of the information that looked a little bit suspicious, but let me share my screen. I, I want to share a little bit about just the nature of the process so you can see what some of these digital budgeting processes look like, and then you can maybe um, imagine yeah, that'd be how awesome. it's important. Okay, cool. So let me um, just share my screen. 
So this is the engagement here. Um, and it was, you know, a budgeting process, a capital project budgeting process in particular. And, you know, there's a bunch of different pages down the right-hand side. And basically the choice was, um, you know, people had to um, indicate their property value, how much their properties was worth, and it would calculate how much tax they had to pay every year. And then people could vote on different new facilities, um, how much they might like, you know, an indoor pool um, or, you know, an outdoor pool. They could make choices. They could look at different kinds of facilities like a, a cultural center. And as they're voting for things, you can see in the right hand side, it would show them um, what their property tax was now, and then how much extra tax they would have to pay if the city went ahead with all the capital projects that that particular person voted on. And you Whoa. can see that there's lots of comments on different things and people are debating, you know, how much is it worth to me to have an extra swimming pool? How much more tax uh, would I be willing to pay? And so I think we had about a thousand people go through this process and um, you know, we got a, a number of results out of it, but what it came out of, to the in the end is it identified a plan or a budget uh, for Stratford that had uh, quite high support in the community. It had, um, you can see this little map here, everybody to the right of the middle was basically in support. And it um, identified the, the average property tax bill and the average um, tax increase. And it showed, um, what different initiatives the community support. So, you know, you have this list here of different um, capital projects and there's a very broad support in the community for this particular list and for basically an average tax increase of $99. So you can see you know, how this would be very uh, useful for financial planners, it basically- Totally. Yeah. But the danger was the doubt well, is this actually good data? Like, can we trust it? And there was right. a whole conversation that we had to have about making sure um, that this was, you know, reliable information. So this kind of thing um, is going to become more and more important, I think, as um, more cities engage uh, the communities in digital democracy processes like this. And I'm curious, Leon, have you... Um, considered um, how your passport technology might be helpful for local governments or, um, you know, in, in non-crypto communities? Yeah, um, I did. Um, I think in, in this case, for example, one, one thing that might have helped the strat, for example, right, would have been to verify that like every voter or like every participant in this app, like is a Stratford citizen. Um, yeah. And you might define that by residency or actually being registered and having voting rights. I mean, that would be up to the organizers, right? Or even like, there might even be like both accepted, but then say the, the actual registered citizens had more voting weights than just residents who are there like for a couple of months or just a year, right? Um, and and what you could do is that if like the city would have some database, right, that would indicate who the citizens are and who the residents are, we could issue identity markers or what we call stamps into the passports um, that represent like residency or citizenship. And then in turn, when like people would participate in, in this, like pilot or maybe in another pilot and some other decision in the city, they would always just need to sign in with their like, um, like account from the Gitcoin passport, which they arguably like pretty much accountably control themselves. Like they would have like a, a private key, like a long cryptic string, like a, like a crypto wallet, which um, is like very difficult to, to attack to then um, identify themselves in these processes. While I say this though, um, like if you, if you take good care of your private key, that is true. And it is like difficult to attack that, but like some of the folks in the audience, including you, 
John like um, will know that like people lose their private keys all the time. So, <laughs> so, yeah. so I think that's actually kind of interesting and in, in thinking through like how this might be applied in cities. I think one big hurdle is that at least in the current state of the cryptocurrency ecosystem and like where like people are like there's some like account management services that like help you maintain your private key like the the access that like the access right to your identity um but it it's still like kind of a nerdy thing i would say to like manage like cryptocurrency accounts yeah, yeah. like i don't enjoy the experience although i've been kind of used to it by working on this technology and i'm sure like it like it totally might be overwhelming for like i don't know people who might already struggle to use like personal computers or smartphones so i think that's actually maybe a drawback right now that like in cities where like digital adoption by the broad population isn't like as high anyways like adding that additional complexity where we say hey now you control your account and if you forget your passport your passport yeah. is gone you know <laughs> like yeah. Yeah. might actually like create so much friction and just terms of education and like to get everybody on board yeah. as to it being useful so i can imagine a world like that in 10 years it's like very mainstream maybe to like use yeah. this type of technology and then it's like normal but i think in like average cities around the globe it's probably yeah. difficult to implement it today because of that like yeah, like we're lack experience. of experience with it yeah yeah we're we're starting they're called um, a distributed autonomous organization. Gitcoin is already a DAO. They're called DAOs. They're kind of these um, blockchain-based communities online. And, um, you know, there's DAOs that are called crypto-native, where, you know, people that are involved in the DAO have been working in the crypto space for a long time and they're very familiar with it. But for our organization, we're bringing in a lot of people that are not um, Web3-native. They're... They've never seen, heard of Web3. And um, we have found Interesting. That, yeah. And we found that one of the biggest challenges for people is to get a wallet um, and even just install a wallet on their computer. I mean, it's not too hard, but it does require some familiarity. And so I, I totally agree with you, Leon. Like, um, I think the, the crypto, the blockchain space has got to evolve the user experience um, very significantly. Right. Um, in order for it to be very seamless. You know, it's gotta have not very much friction because the more friction that there is, people fall off and then you don't right. have a representative group anymore. You know, you just have the right. computer experts participating and, and you know, <laughs> get a skewed result right. in the budget. But yeah. These people. Yeah. yeah. So I think maybe, you know, it might work in like more startup-ish cities. You know, maybe a pilot like this might work and like, local governance pilots in Mountain View, California, <laughs> or like, you know, like, I don't know, more, kind of more techy, tech savvy cities like Miami, San Francisco, or like even just the technology districts of these cities. Yeah. But I, and additionally, like there's some like kind of wild experiments driven by like cryptocurrency people who literally like kind of buy land in the middle of nowhere and then want to build a city that like is from the get-go governed with like these technologies. So I think these are much more likely places that might like meaningfully involve most of their members and like this way benefit from governance processes organized through blockchains. But uh, I think at least for the participatory experiment, like in, in like kind of mainstream cities around the world, it's probably not. You know, I, I think um, it, it's it's slow coming, and I think there's a lot of you know development to make the user experience smooth for people. But I also see uh, the inevitability of it. You know, and you know, one of the the mission of our organization is to try to accelerate a transition to a digital democracy. You know, our, the current democratic system we have. You know, seventy one percent of Americans are deeply concerned about the state of democracy in the United States. 
and it, the number is growing every year. And it's because we have a democratic system that you know, was designed 200 years ago, you know, when the population was 1% of what it is right now, even, even before the telegraph. Uh, so you know, it's a very old technology, our democratic system. And it's inevitable that we are going to transition to something much more um, user-friendly, uh, smart, accessible, you know, where participation is not just at once every four or five years, but you know, you might participate on a weekly basis. Maybe it's a hobby that you're, you know, participating in certain kinds of decisions. And so I think that is coming. And you know, you, you hear talk of blockchain and well, what is that? All that crypto stuff and the wild news headlines of crashes and hacks and all the stuff. But inside there, you know, there's some very promising technologies and. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the beginning of the internet. You know, the beginning of the internet, people were looking at it, it's like, what is this thing? And you know, the, we had the crash and it was, all, it was all a bunch of scams. Um, and we're kind of in that stage a little bit with um, blockchain, but at the end of the tunnel, there's going to emerge some really important um, technologies for democracy itself and for local governments too. Hi, Christopher. Uh, I'm, I'm here. I was just letting you know we have a few more minutes, but um, please continue. Oh, okay. Um, I have a question for you, Leon. You know, one of the things that excites me about blockchain as well, besides from digital identity, is, uh, um, is zero knowledge proofs. And this is ways right. of counting votes. And I, I would love if you could just explain zero knowledge computation for folks, because I think it's a very important kind of technology yeah. for your democracy. Yeah, happy to. Um, so zero knowledge proofs are basically just a, a technological method to facilitate um, applications like voting applications and and i think a nice way to understand it is basically that you could um for example prove to like a voting application that you have a certain identity certificate that you need for example like residency and in, in a certain gov like judiciary right or like in a, in a certain area without disclosing your identity certificate so i'd be able to prove that i'm a like german citizen without submitting my whole passport including like my name birth date address changes of address and whatsoever to to that digital application and and if you think about it, like implicitly this will then also give me voting privacy right so i'd be able to to sign in to this application by proving to that application with zero knowledge about like what I have and um, that I have it without really disclosing it. And then I can vote after I've signed in. So like the computing system wouldn't be able to map my vote to my name or like to my, even the rest of my passport. So that's like also like pretty nascent, but um, some communities in, in like some like democratic communities inside the blockchain system have experimented with it but um yeah i like that you point that out because I mean, technically like that's obviously a concern like privacy and like digital voting yeah. um but it this is like pretty much a very like promising path pathway to mitigate that risk as we scale up digital elections yeah you know if you think about the voting booth how important is the voting booth, the privacy of the voting booth to elections? And the internet doesn't really guarantee that kind of privacy right now. So you fail out of the gate. You, you can't do digital democracy. Right. Because you can't yeah. have the privacy of the voting booth. It just doesn't happen. But things like zero knowledge proof, zero knowledge complication, uh, they can. And so the whole of this blockchain space is coming up with solutions to all the different parts of the dem democratic process. And um, they're starting to get connected together. And I think that's what's going to give birth to new kinds of citizen engagement um, by local governments, which is going to be vastly, um, vast, vast improvements over the kind of voting process that we have now and much more easy for people to um, participate in and also give intelligent feedback to. You know, you saw the voting process that I showed before. People get to decide how much more tax dollars they can spend on these different things. The only problem is reliability. You know, is this really what the community feels? Right. Yeah. Totally. And just, uh, I think it's it's crazy to highlight that. Like, I'm, I'm kind of firing that number from the hip, but I, I read a report by 
think it was the MIT on like how much it costs to operate a federal election in the US and like just all setting up all the voting booths and the counting infrastructure like that uh, that uh, amounts like billions in in cost just to operate it and through like using these more scalable technologies say combination of like digital identity blockchains and your knowledge proofs you can basically get the same qualities like privacy censorship resistance maybe even more censorship resistance than in like physical elections and and do it at much lower cost after the software is like kind of in a good enough state where you merely need to maintain it over time 